Uh, Pete Buttigieg joins us right now, the Transportation Secretary of the United States. Secretary, very good having you with us, sir. Um, your reaction to the Herculean task that Floridians face right now? Well, it's just heartbreaking as we hear more and more of the stories of people who've been impacted by the storm, but also impressive to see how many people are pulling together to respond and to offer support from the work that the National Guard and first responders are doing to the work of state officials. Uh, of course, the federal side doing everything that we can to help as well. And uh, it's, it's very clear that this is going to be a long, long road to recovery, whether we're talking about individuals uh, restoring access to their homes or whether we're talking about some of the massive infrastructure work that's going to have to be done. I mean, you saw uh, in the report just now uh, more about that uh, uh, that causeway into Sanibel Island. The uh, only way to uh, get there right now is by boat. Uh, restoring that uh, road and bridge access, obviously a big, big project, but we will be there to help every way that we can as a department. And I know the whole country right now is thinking about everyone who's been impacted by these storms. And it has been everyone, it seems, and certainly along the Gulf Coast, sir. I wanted to get your thoughts on some comments that Vice President Harris had met. Now, there's easy ways to rejigger her comments, so I wanted to quote exactly and get your reaction to it, where she said, we have to address this in a way that is giving resources based on equity, understanding that we fight for equality, but we also need to fight for equity. She went on to say, sir, if we want people to be in an equal place, sometimes we need to take into account those disparities and do that work. Some read into those comments, Secretary, uh, that it's not even Stevens, that some need the help more and should get more of that help. Well, uh, uh, certainly everybody's case is different. If your home was lightly damaged, that's different than if your home was destroyed. Uh, if you live uh, in a neighborhood that was completely cut off from resources, uh, that's different than, than if you live in, in a neighborhood that uh, uh, has many access points. And I think we all know that uh, uh, some Americans uh, bear the brunt most of all of uh, extreme weather events. And we've got to make sure that we're helping everybody uh, based on the need that is there, that it's fair, uh, that it's equitable. And, and that's that's something that I think you see built into the process right now, certainly the work that FEMA is doing on the ground uh, and uh, into everything that we do to try to make sure that people are, uh, are, are made whole and ultimately can, can even come out of this stronger. Well, as you know, sir, it's been interpreted differently by different people that maybe she was saying that the minorities or others should get special treatment or moved ahead of the line here. Reverend Franklin Graham, with whom I chatted earlier today, uh, said maybe that was not her intention, but that was the message. I want you to respond to this from Franklin Graham. Well, I, I disagree with her. I think we help all people. And uh, no question, uh, we look for people that are uninsured. Uh, we look for people that have no way to build back. And that's who we want to help and try to, to, to stand beside. But, you know, a, a person that lost a roof that may have a big house, another person lost a roof and may have a small house, they still both lost their roofs. And uh, their contents are getting wet, they're being destroyed, and they need help. What did you think of that? Well, look, I think some uh, there, there, there are some folks who see uh, politics where it doesn't need to be. Uh, in the end, I think you do need to help everybody um, based on their need. Now, uh, if your uh, vacation home got damaged, that's probably having a different effect on your life than if your only home got damaged. And, uh, you know, often whether we're talking about the insurance process uh, or whether we're talking about uh, government processes, federal, state and otherwise, uh, you take account for people who are absolutely desperate experiencing hunger and their lives are in danger even today uh, from those who just need to work their way through an insurance process to try to uh, get things back to normal. But, but again, I think that's something that we should agree on more than we disagree on. And, and of course, we recognize that there are many Americans who were vulnerable the day the storm hit. Uh, they're even more vulnerable now. And we've got to make sure we uh, take care of them and take care of everybody to get them back on their feet. So, Secretary, I just want to distinguish what you're saying. Uh, you would draw a distinction, two homes next to each other, both demolished. One was the main home, only home for a homeowner, versus the home next door that was a second home or a vacation home. I guess I'm just speaking in terms of common sense, right? So uh, if you know that uh, somebody is, uh, again, for example, their lives are in danger today, 
because they're experiencing food insecurity. Uh, you know, you need to make sure there are resources to uh, make sure that, that, that they're going to be okay. Uh, and, you know, the, whether we're talking about government assistance, whether we're talking about faith-based assistance or uh, organizations like the Red Cross, they tend to do a very good job of identifying the people who are most vulnerable, whether it's because of a medical condition, uh, whether it's because of economic circumstances or anything else. And uh, I think that's exactly what we're going to see play out here. Secretary, um, as you know, much of the power was out across half the state of Florida for a while. M much of it is resumed, sir, but uh, it did make some folks think, boy, these electric vehicles that are being pushed between what happened in Florida and the grid that was compromised to the point where California Governor Newsom wanted people to cool it for a while uh, on when and how often they charge their EVs. Do you think this reminds folks that we're not ready or the EVs are not ready for prime time? Well, actually, I think this is a great example of one of the many benefits of, of those tools. Uh, you know, I was just at the Detroit Auto Show a couple weeks ago. Uh, one of the things that was very impressive about some of the vehicles that we saw, uh, including, the, uh, for example, the, the pickup trucks that, that are on the market, entering onto the market right now, is that their power can actually flow both ways. So in an extreme event, from a neighborhood resiliency perspective, they can actually work basically like a generator, except that you don't have to have a, a diesel ready for them. What they're doing is they're using the battery capacity to, uh, uh, to power a home, and, and in that sense could be very useful in a scenario like this. Look, I don't think anybody uh, thinks that we're ready in here sitting here in 2022 for a scenario where you know overnight there was some uh, instant transition to electric vehicles we, we want to do so by 2035 industry, right in some that, states uh, like california uh, florida preparing. we want to do so oh i'm sorry but in new york we want to do so by 2035 do you think we'd be ready to do that well, yeah, I mean, GM said they're not even going to be making uh, anything but electric vehicles after 2035. So if the United States of America can execute a transition like this over the course of more than a decade, yeah. um, I don't know what to tell you. This is America. Of course we can do something right, like look, that. Look, and different well, states have different you've approaches. You've been pushing but, for this. You've been very consistent with that. But Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, the Georgia Republican at a rally in Michigan, said this uh, past weekend uh, that... Mr. Buttigieg is trying to emasculate the way we drive by, as she goes on to explain, by supporting environmentally friendly transportation. But what did you think of her wording? I, I literally don't even understand what that means. I mean, my sense of manhood is not connected to whether my vehicle is fueled by gasoline or whether it's fueled by electricity. This is a practical matter. Were you offended, by, it? Were you offended sure. by that, sir? Because even people who you know, share her politics, didn't share that view. Yeah, it was a strange thing to say. Uh, you know, to be honest, there are other members of Congress that I pay more attention to uh, when I'm thinking about uh, opinions that, that, that uh, really matter or ideas that are going to be critical to engage with. I, I do think we need to zoom out a little bit. And I know people want to make this ideological. They want to make it political. We're talking about something like electric vehicles. We're talking again about a very practical matter, which is, how we get from point A to point B. And if industry and the world are uh, moving in a direction that adept, uh, adopts a new technology, you know, the real question is, are we going to let China lead that or are we going to lead it here in the United States of America? Again, the things that I've seen, whether it's what I saw at the Detroit Auto Show a couple of weeks ago when I was there with the president or what you see Tesla and, and these newer companies doing, uh, it's really extraordinary. It's something we all ought to be proud of. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we also know that uh, we, we ought to be prepared. Uh, America has never been a country to live in the past. And I think that's especially true when you look at the finest tradition of our automotive sector. And I think uh, we're going to have a lot to be proud of when we look at how America ultimately leads the way into this EV future. Nevertheless, as you know, sir, the uh, OPEC and OPEC plus countries are ready to cut production, maybe up to a million barrels a day. Uh, and we're kind of going hat in hand and surprised by that. Uh, there's a debate as to whether the president will resume taking money out of the strategic or oil out of the strategic petroleum reserve. But do you find it odd that we're even in that situation? You know, uh, I definitely think we'll be in a better situation when we're not dependent on a commodity that is largely being produced in foreign dictatorships. It's one of many, many reasons why American energy security will benefit from homegrown clean energy, which is, of course, exactly the direction we're trying to go into for the long term. For the short term, you've had measures like uh, the strategic oil reserve, measures like the flexibility on ethanol. A big part of the reason why 
You saw gas prices go down so much over the summer, and we've got to make sure we're continuing to bring that short-term relief, because uh, even though I'm excited about America leading the way into a future where we don't have to wait on uh, some Middle Eastern country in order to get our energy, uh, uh, you know, the, the reality is that's not happening overnight, and uh, we've got to make sure we're prepared on both fronts. But we have to restock that reserve. Would you be for or against doing that? Uh, in terms of getting the reserve uh, rebalance, look, uh, uh, that's uh, a little outside of my lane in terms of uh, transportation, other than I'm very glad uh, that the president led the way, both, by the way, with the U.S., but also with partners uh, on a coordinated action to, uh, uh, to get more of that petroleum onto the market to help stabilize the prices. But again, this is just one of a million reasons why we're all going to be better off when American-made clean energy is dominating uh, the way that, that we fuel our transportation systems and our economy. But you're not against fossil fuels per se, because even when someone like Elon Musk says we need that and, and, and we need it for a while now, you agree with that? Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like we can uh, we can assume that just tomorrow the sun's going to come up and uh, we don't need any any fossil fuels, right? We're in a transition, and transitions are complicated. And again, it's one of the reasons why you saw the president act so aggressively to bring gas prices down, make it easier for Americans to afford gas, because you know most Americans are, are, are driving a gas-powered car, uh, and so it's one of many reasons why we need to manage this transition in a smart way. But. But we can't afford to, to drag our feet, and there's certainly nothing to be gained uh, by trying to stop this progress or slow down American leadership when it's, it's very clear uh, that industry and, and the world are moving in a direction that's going to be cleaner uh, at a time when, when most of us believe that climate change is real. And most of us recognize there are amazing numbers of good-paying American jobs to be had if we insist on the U.S. rather than somebody like China leading the way into that clean energy future. Secretary Buttigieg, very nice having you on the show. Be well, sir. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.